Hi, and welcome to Road to Revenue. This is the podcast where we talk to creators to understand the bumps in the road, the twists, the turns on their own Road to Revenue. Joining me today is creator, businesswoman, speaker. I've had the pleasure of listening to her actually command an audience, which was absolutely amazing on her birthday uh, at uh, TubeFest. Welcome, Desiree. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm super pumped. Uh, do you know what? I'm super, super glad you could join us. And, you know, this is really where we get to, well, peel back the, the layers of wisdom that you've built up over the years. Um, but of let's it's start off. Well, onion. It's a very big <laughs> onion. Weird. I but, think but, here. And, and like lots of knowledge to unpack and lots of wisdom. So it'll be absolutely brilliant, I'm sure. Uh, but let's let's start. How how'd you get going? What's your what's your origin story? Oh, my gosh. It's. I mean, it's long. It's 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 long and lengthy. Okay, so let's see if I can do this as quickly as possible. So I've been in the social media online marketing creator space for 15 years. I got started in the MySpace days because I had graduated from college with um, hopes of being an animator for Disney, and then the recession happened, and I just could not make it work. And I I was very much like I got to get a job, and people kept asking me what's this Facebook social media thing, and I just was like, let's let's go, let's make that a thing that we do. Um, and so one day I was talking with somebody about like how to use Facebook as like a way to like get leads, like for my graphic design freelance work that I was doing at the time. And he was like, this is what you should do. You should do the social thing. And I was like, no one's going to pay me to be on Facebook. And I eat my words every day, obviously, because I, so I get paid to do be on Facebook and instant TikTok and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I've just been doing this for a long time. So I've been, I, I got started way back in the day in the origin stories of like where it all started. And I've just watched it change and grow and some platforms come, some platforms go, some lots of platforms changing, lots of regulations, lots of phases and stages of like how it all works. I got into YouTube though, in 2017 as a, a YouTube creator, because I needed a way to get leads to my marketing business that I had because my husband was in the Air Force and we got moved to Korea. And so I was like, well, how am I supposed to keep getting leads if I live on the other side of the world, a different language, different time zone? It was a whole thing. And, and YouTube became that that funnel for me. And it was a long, bumpy road filled with lots of bad, bad videos. But I figured it out and I made it work. And, and from being in this YouTuber space, there were so many other like like opportunities that unlocked along the way. And so I just side quested my way through this adventure. <laughs> uh, do you know, it, 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 that is quite a varied start um, and, and born out of need, right? I mean, the, and, and not just, not just your husband, you know, thanking him for his service. Cause we, you know, we're, we're very grateful of that, but, but also thank you for yours. I, I get the whole, you know, military spouses are also there supporting. Um, so, you know, very much thank you. And, that's got to be difficult to kind of manage that upheaval. How, how did you fit in moving the business other than changing your channel and, and driving into YouTube? What? It's so funny. Talk, this is, tell this me is, through that. Yeah. This is such a funny question. So I grew up a military kid. So moving right. is something that's just in my DNA. Like even now where we're in our like forever home in Michigan and we are coming into three years in September of living here, this will be the longest my husband and I have ever lived one place, the longest for our entire adult lives. Wow. And we're 39, right? So like that's 21 years ish. It's the longest we've lived anywhere for um, an extended period of time. And so moving a lot isn't hard for us. So it's a lot like, so I am hardwired for like adapt and overcome. I, I don't know. I, it's a skill that I think a lot of military kids just really develop on their own. They, they usually go one of two routes. Either they're like very adaptable, very social, very outgoing, or they're like, I never want to move again. I'm going to stay somewhere. I'm an introvert. Like I just like sit in my corner. And so I was in the adaptable side and I've just been able to be successful in that because I just think on my feet and I always keep going and, and making things work. And YouTube came into my life as an accident. My husband had really gotten into it in like 2016. He was working, he was trying to learn how to like make like a video game level. And then he was like, this YouTube thing is pretty fun. Like as a place to like get entertainment. And then I started watching some stuff with him. I thought this is really cool. And he's like, you should, you should do this. I was like, what? Why? Like, what would I do? Like, 
it's we as I was I'm like in the throes of like my postpartum body and life with my second kid and running this business on this side while he's like deploying or doing all this stuff. And I'm like, ah, when we moved, it was very, when I, when I, we had the, um, plan for moving a, a book had come out at the same time. That's called vlog, like a boss by Amy, um, Schmittauer Landino. And it was like a roadmap for me. It was like, Oh, this is how you do this. And a lot of the things that she talks about, like are still relevant to this day, like eight years later or whatever. And so like, that's what it was. It's like, well, I needed, I had, I had a new thing to do. And when we got to Korea, um, they have incredibly affordable childcare. And so I was able to put my kids into that during the day so that they could have like all that mental physical stimulation that they needed as little kids and focus on this, this, my, my agency and figuring out like where it could go and what it could be. And it was a really good thing that I had done that because, um, after our, our tour in Korea that my husband had done, like we really started to unravel that staying in the military wasn't right for us. And ultimately my husband actually is now a disabled veteran uh, from PTSD. Um, I needed to be able to use the agency to replace his income. And because I had done all that like pre-work with YouTube and stuff, it allowed for me to have a lot of foundational building blocks. When we came back to the States and like moving forward and positioning myself in education opportunities and going to events and, and doing all these things that have a amplified my personal brand and amplified like how I make money. With the personal brand side then, like you've, because you had a business, right? You had a business, you have a business, it's thriving. You're, you're delivering the marketing for other, other people, other businesses, mm -hmm. the creator side of it. How, how do you balance those two or, or, are they one of the same? They 100% support each other. So being a creator is to be a business owner. Like if it's like you reach every creator reaches a point on their journey where they're like, how is this going to be a business, a job, an income stream for me or something, something sustainable. And while there are people out there, very few though, that do it for the love of it there's no skin in the game with it to like allow them to keep doing it. So in order to like allow for it to be something that people can keep doing, they have to have some sort of revenue that comes from it. And so for me uh, doing online marketing for 15 years, like there's been a ton of changes in my business because my industry has changed so much, but because I'm a creator, I'm in it, I'm changing with it. I'm adapting with it. And so it gives me a unique perspective that I'm able to give to my clients that allows for them to learn from my experiences, what I'm done and keep them up with like what in all the things that you're doing, like what is the system that makes sense for, for my business? Because like who I'm working with, it's not like I'm like the marketing person, like to the stars. Like I'm not like, helping Keith Lee with his marketing strategy. I am working much more like normal, smaller businesses that, you know, they make somewhere in the six to seven figure ranges and they don't have anyone that's doing their marketing. They've been able to build like what they're doing, like through word of mouth or like Google ads, like this basic stuff. And so they need like a really holistic plan that is also supported like marketing manager work. And so that's a lot of like what I do to like make them work. So you can't, I don't think, I think being a creator allows for me to be a better marketer because it allows for me to understand it. And I do it myself. Like, so I practice what I preach. So anything I have for my clients do, I'm like, well, I have my own strategy. This is what I am doing along the path for it. Yeah. I mean, it de definitely sounds like you, you get your hands dirty. Oh yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Like my, my, it's so like my studio, I have a, in, in Michigan, it's we're basement culture here. And so we have a whole part of our, Un our basement that's unfinished and this is my studio and so it's like this is so nice and well lit and stuff like for a very strategic reason but you look around me it's like there's tripods everywhere and and you know equipment and gear and lights all over and cables and stuff and it's because i'm always like fidgeting with something or trying to make a shot better or how do i make a background better or how do i adjust the light you know trying to always make it better from like a tech and, per and like visual standpoint um just so that i can allow for the content perform better and, and test it again, like, and then apply my own creative curiosity and then apply it like to the business and stuff. So take me back to, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to have to dig in. You're fine. My space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th that that's when, when, when you're, you're, you're building my space, 
profiles were you for businesses? Yes. So, okay. So back in my day, right, when we were doing things online. So when I graduated high school in 2003 and I went to college um, like a month afterwards because I went to like a private art school that was on a quarter program rather than a semester program. And so I dove right into it. And like, I want to say in like 2004, MySpace was like where we were. Like that is where we like found each other. That's where like we would connect. It's where like we would top eight, like high school friends would come together. And that's when you're just like, oh my God, I wish I could see it. Like there's no, like that's all gone. Like the, like the records of MySpace are gone, but I, I probably on purpose, but it's like, all of the things that we did was there. Like it's how we communicated, we're connected. It's where I learned about a lot of music. Like I got my, I found like my new era of music that I got to do in there. I loved the top eight. I love the like blogginess of it. I love the raw authenticity of it. Like it was just a really great place. And then in 2006, I had the, I was fortunate enough to do a study abroad program in Italy and my roommates were on Facebook and they're like, Oh, my space is so lame. You got to get on Facebook. And I was like, it's what we do where I live. Cause they were from the East coast. And I was from Colorado at the time because in the East coast, like that's where it all started in like Harvard, <laughs> New England and stuff. And so I got on cause I had a college email and I was like, I just poked around in it and it was kind of cool and stuff, but it wasn't until like after college and then like more of my college peers and stuff had come together and then they opened it up to everybody that became bigger. But with my space, it still had like a relevant place. And it was a place where like millenn like elder millennials, young Gen Xers, like were spending their time. And I was working with brands to use MySpace. So I'd create a profile for them as a brand. And it was like for apartment communities. Um, my aunt runs and my aunt, she just sold it, but she had a company she did that did apartment marketing. And they were trying to find new ways to reach this millennial audience for apartment communities that are like around colleges. And so they're like, let's get on MySpace and see how this goes. And so we made pages and we did the glitters and the customized colors and the profile pictures and the top eights, all the things like, and we just, we showed up there and it had, it had a place. And then we pivoted to Facebook once we all discovered what, how pages worked and how you could just make a page and get like crazy traction really easy. Cause you were one of the first ones doing it. Yeah. And it's, and how much of that have you brought through? Because it, 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 there's got to be some foundational pieces, right? That that have stuck with you from yeah. from that, you know, from from the initial start. Well, like I think the biggest things that have stayed the same from my, it's one, it's being where your target audience is, right? You need to be there. Two, branding matters. Like like you know, we're doing our same colors, our logos. We want to be like having that there, and like how we identify ourselves is there. Like like our our descriptions are kind of very much the same. Um, but yeah, the biggest one I think is like being where your audience is and like, how do we follow a trend that makes sense? And, and that is like where that first initial lesson was learned. That's a really big play, right? Like, like now, and, and that's only certainly ramped up more with TikTok with, with, uh, Instagram. On, well, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't the a lot of places, social, it wasn't like, it wasn't a social network. It was like, um, I don't even remember. It was like a, it was like a it's like an online hangout. Like it didn't mm. have an identity as like what it was. It was MySpace and Friendster. And then this Facebook thing came in. And I think it wasn't until it became available to anybody that like this whole like social network idea had come out because at the same time, Twitter had also come out and Foursquare had come out. And so they were like playing in this field of like, smartphones were now coming out and we were checking in on places and like we could say things that were on our mind. And that's why like I Twitter became a toilet activity. Like, you know, it's just like all of these new ways that we do stuff. We did things like now they're so second nature. Like we don't even think about it. It's the second nature is like, I like checking email or feeding yourself sometimes. And so, but that's like where that kind of that idea of it, I all started people are like figuring out and what is this new thing? And, and, and it also came about in a recession, right? And in the recession, there was so much, there was no way to like go do stuff, right? Like we, we, we weren't, we didn't, like, especially with my like generation, we didn't have a lot of money. We were, a lot of us had to move back in with our parents. I know I did. And they're like, I just needed an outlet to, to communicate and commune with people because I didn't have that anymore. 
and you know that's like, like websites like meetup.com came about and all that like it's all those things that are like happening in that era that are now like so second nature now like in our like 20 whatever years later 15 years later since all that happened and so it's but it also moved so fast and changed so fast and became adopted so fast and like so now i think where we exist in a social space is it's really about who you are generationally and who you are like, and all like your interests that will dictate like where your time is kind of the most time is spent yeah no i and, and i can i can completely understand that from a there's a there's a natural I don't know. Is it a, a a preference, a natural preference from a platform to platform basis on on the things that I guess excite and delight? Yeah, um, like I think it's it's all about where like I have friends that like swear by Facebook still. They're like, hmm. this is I, I, I have a friend named Austin. He has over a million followers on his like professional profile on Facebook, and he's like, it's where I get the most business, where I get the most attention. It's where I have the largest audience. Like. I can't argue with this. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to argue with that either. And it works for him. And he is like, I think he's a couple years younger than me. Like he's been in this space almost as long as I have. Um, another friend of mine, she does PR and she does a lot of PR, especially like she had a very strong like military community um, connection because she was voted like military spouse of the year, like 10 years ago or something like that. And so she's done a ton in that space. So a lot of people are in her industry that are in that like, 40 to 50 age and so facebook is like her main platform and then she backs it up with like instagram so it's really about like what you have found to be successful if you like for me when i think about like where do i spend my time and like what do i prefer to consume as a professional as a personal is different like i have facebook but i'm not in love with it in the same way that i would to me facebook's like a diary because it's so old it had it like i can i love memories and all the old like things it did for me but it doesn't quite reach who I want it to anymore. And so like for me, like I find my best audiences on YouTube and LinkedIn. And then where I spend my time personally is on TikTok because I love the complete polar difference that it is from like my work life mm. on, on my, for my downtime. So it's just preference and interest and techiness that goes into all these decisions. How much does that play into like the like actually what you create? Like the there's got to be you know what's your from creating? Is it YouTube? Is that your is that your favorite platform to create for? It's the most practical. Like it's the most like business common sense place to me because it's I can do so much with the content I create on YouTube. It's the top of my funnel. It's how I get email lists. It's how I get leads. How I share my knowledge and my experience. It's I can put those into social posts. I can turn them into other things. Like right now, like, and like when we're recording this, like I'm going through a, um, a company rebrand. And so I haven't been posting onto my YouTube channel. I'm giving myself that grace period. Cause I'm like, I have nothing. I, I like what I, I don't have anything to funnel it to right now. So I would have agreed anything on it. And eventually it takes me time and resources that I'm not ready to commit to it. Cause I'm doing my rebrand. And so it's kind of one of those things. Um, for me that I like the most when I talk about where I like to connect with people though, I read to prefer it on LinkedIn. Right. It, it is that something you had to foster or did that just come quite naturally? Well, I mean, I'm very adaptable. I'm very chameleon like when it comes to social situations and social scenarios. Um, so LinkedIn made a lot of sense to me because it allowed, it acts as a really great bridge for me for my real life interaction. Cause I love going to events. I love networking. I love conferences. So being able to have a place to take a real life interaction and continue that relationship is a big deal to me. And I used to do that on Facebook, but it just never felt as right or as good. Right. And, and then the algorithm went all weird. And so I, I much more prefer being able to do that on LinkedIn. So not going back all the way to uh, MySpace necessarily, but, but perhaps, um, this is the road to revenue, right? So we're really curious to understand when was your first revenue and do you when remember they, what that felt like? Um, for me, it was a relief. That was probably the biggest feeling I had because I was able to, it was, it was creating stuff on MySpace as part of contract work. 
that I had um, with my for my graphic design background. <laughs> I was making like twelve dollars an hour and like freelance work. Like it was a rough time. <laughs> Um, but it was a really, cause I was like, oh, I can pay for my car payment this month. Like, and I was able to do that cause I couldn't get work. Like that was very difficult. Like I, I, it was a, a system that like failed a generation. Right. And, and, and it's just really frustrating. It's continuing to fail, the gener- uh, continuing to fail people, but it's very much like, um, it was, it was a very big relief to me and being able to like, I had, I started connecting dots in a way I never thought of before. Cause I was not raised or bred for entrepreneurship. I was raised to, you go to school, you get good grades and then you get a job and you stay at that job. And like, and that's your lot in life. Cause that's how I grew up. It's how a lot of us grew up and it's how my, as a, as a military kid, that's how I grew up. Like there's those consistencies and all that stuff. Entrepreneurship is such a roller coaster, And I was like, not prepared for it. But you could, I could never go back to a corporate job. It would take a lot for me to take a corporate job, <laughs> right? Like I just, I was just was on LinkedIn before I was talking with you and the guy who's like the head, the head of creator marketing for TikTok just left. I'm like, I could take that kind of a job. That's like, a, like that's the kind of work I could see myself doing if I had to like get a job again but like it's so because I love having control of my time and I love having control of my income like I have no revenue limits with what I do mm-hmm. here a job is such a revenue limitation and so how, how do you cap what you do then because you know with with no limits to revenue how do you decide what you are pursuing um, it's a very good question. So it ebbs and flows. So like right now I'm in a development phase with my business because I have to, I'm rebranding. My agency was as all in one social media where we focus on package based social media marketing services. And it just isn't a model that works anymore. But I also need to figure out then what can I do instead? And so what I'm doing instead, I'm rebranding to my company is called the cast agency where we elevate your business's success. And it focuses on holistic marketing paired with fractional CMO services. And it's a, it's a concept that makes sense to me, but it's also way more financially lucrative where with like all in one, I would charge you like 500 bucks a month with the new packaging and how the new structure works. It's like $5,000 a month. And so I'm able to take those on and I'm only limited in the agency by how fast I, how fast I can hire qualified people. Like my, I'm, I'm hiring a salesperson. I have a lot of the processes in place for what I do. I know that I need, um, I'll need marketing managers and social media marketers, and I'll need an editor. Like I know the things I'm going to need to have in place, um, as we scale and continue to grow. Like it just makes sense to me in that kind of way. But I also, because of all the creator work I've done, right. My age, my, my creator work has always supported my business always, my creator work, I have these other things that are in place that I can continue to do. Like I have the women of video podcast, which is in a partnership with vidIQ that pays me a thousand dollars a month. I I'm, I've had partnerships, with other brands would pay me a few thousand dollars a month too. Like one of the companies that I'm working with, cause I love what I do as a creator economy strategist to help brands and creators navigate the creator economy so they can make money. So I partner with companies I really believe in that have great revenue opportunities for creators attached to so Like I work with Gigastar, which uh, basically turns YouTubers into a public offering, right? So like they're able to work with and they get like a lot of investors that invest a little bit of money in them and they get influx of capital to help them with their business. They pay me to their podcast and be a member of their marketing team. We do social and things like that. And that's, that's that money. And then I also have Adobe row, which is a platform that allows you to repurpose your content onto Chinese social networks because none of us have access to them and they don't have access to us because of how the, the laws of our countries work. And so it's a Korean company that has a, a platform that bridges it and creators can make money as soon as they upload videos because they've built relationships with all of the the Billy Billies and all that of the world over in China. So you don't have to go through all their creator qualifications. You just qualify there. And then you can get more sponsorship opportunities and build a global brand like those. So those are partners I have that we've built financial relationships together around. And I, I support and I help them, but like, 
I, I'm only limited by my time, but I'm also only limited by, again, by how many people I can hire to systemize things out to. Like I'm a big advocate for like creating a system and handing it off so it can work. And I've always, I've always done that because not always. I remember the first time I did this and it scared the shit out of me. It was 2010. I was in the first six months of my business. And one of the biggest things that I would sell to um, companies was called a Facebook landing page. And so it was this thing. So before we had the timeline, which is like the current, it's what we've had on Facebook since 2011. It's called the timeline. What we had before it was much more like open forum based and very MySpace like. And there was this thing when you visit a Facebook page for the first time, you'd have a landing page rather than like their feed and all of that stuff. And it would have a like gate. So you'd have to like the page in order to see what was there. And we would do them for like, um, I would do it like restaurants and all kinds of stuff where it would like unlock um, all the information and like a coupon or like a discount, like that kind of thing. And so I was making those. Well, I was networking so much to grow this business. I just was like, it's, I'm finding it really hard to like make these, even though they're very similar. Like I had the code all systemized. I had the, the design very simple and like how it would work. And I got paid 500 bucks a pop, which is a huge amount of money to me in 2010. And so I went onto Craigslist and I found a guy and I'm like, I need someone. I, I went to the resume section and I searched, I think for programmers and I found this guy. Um, and I, I literally, I worked with him on graphic design projects and things like that for, t for 10 years. Like we, it was a magical, like accidental relationship. And what I would do is I said, I have this, how this works. Um, I'll give you the code. You align it so that it works the way it's supposed to. I, I train him on how to do it and we split it. So I would sell them and he would build them. And it was a 20, 80 split. So he got a hundred bucks for every time I sold one of those and he made them, made them work. And it was, it was, I was terrified to do this though. I was like, I'm giving someone all of my code. They're going to go figure out how to do this on their own. And actually someone did end up doing that to me. Um, six months later, it's a whole thing, but it was like, it was my own process. It was really hurt by it, but he didn't like, and cause he's like, well, I don't, he was a very introverted, like designer guy. He's like, I just want to design stuff and make money. And so it worked out very well, um, for us to do this. And it was from that moment I learned, I was like, if I, can create a system and then hire it out. And then I can focus on what I do best, what my realm of genius is. And then they can just financially benefit from it. And then it, and I was able to like sell like four times as many because I didn't have to make them all. And so that just became this big foundational piece of like what I've done to my business ever since. So what, what's been the hardest thing then that you've had to convince yourself or the hardest thing you've had to give up or delegate okay. to someone? Those are three very different questions. Okay. So the hardest thing I've ever had to delegate out, uh, nothing. I've never, I've never had a hard time delegating out something. Any what the right person is teachable. How is it? Hire slow, fire fast, right? Yeah. Like it's that sort of thing and have really strong, like non-competes in place or like proprietary whatever's. Um, the hardest thing about having my business though, has been pricing. And, and this is why the one thing I'm doing, that's my first hire with my rebrand of my agency is I'm hiring a salesperson. I'm great at what I do. I'm great at marketing. I'm great at like idea, ideation, talking to people, connecting with them, like really identifying like, what they need, having conversations, all of that. But it comes time to say like, I would like you to hand me money. It's very hard for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea why I have no idea. It's just this weird mental block because I'm like, well, would I pay for this? And I was like, but I'm also a small business owner and I, and I have like financial limitations and blah, 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 blah. like, it's all this like stupid head trash I have. And so I'm like, I just need someone who can go be aggressive and mean while I just be nice and bubbly and do my job. Like, and that's like what I need, <laughs> needed in my life. It's like very much the difference between, I think like a shark and a manatee, right? Like it's just, it's totally different vibes. Um, but that's been the hardest thing in my business up for, after 15 years, even though I've been able like, which is so weird because 
I'm the breadwinner for my family. My husband's a stay at home dad uh, because of his, uh, his uh, disability. And so like, I have been able to financially be doing this very successfully. <laughs> so I'm like, imagine what I could do with the shark. Right. So, um, so that's been like the hardest piece. And you asked me something else. I don't remember what it was. But... It, hard, it was, so it was hardest, hardest to delegate, right. Okay. Um, hardest thing to, but, but yeah, the hardest thing to give up, um, was yeah. the, the hardest thing to give up in my business is, is not actually business related. The hardest thing for me to give up is my time. Um, and it's, it, it's in a very backwards way. So because my husband is a disabled veteran and I also have two kids that are narrow spicy and they're COVID kids, it's a whole thing. I don't know what it is. My kids and my husband really love me and I want to spend time with me. <laughs> they want to do stuff with me all the time. And, and so, and I'm sometimes like, but I also just, I really like my work. Like I get wrapped up in it. I really like, like the opportunities that it presents. And so I will give, I, so it's hard for me to give up my business time to go do domestic stuff. Um, which is super, I know, kind of like most people are like, oh, I need to give up more domestic stuff to do my business stuff. But for me, it's really the other way around. And a lot of it's because I have a lot of opportunities and I find like my greatest joy and purpose in my work. Um, and I know that sounds kind of counterproductive to like, oh, my, my, I, my why is my kids, but like my purpose, like what makes me fulfilled as a person is through my work because I really feel like it's impactful and really helpful for where brands and individuals are trying to go. And you've, you've seen brands and individuals kind of go through different stages of platforms have changed and mm -hmm. they've adapted, they've evolved. And it, have you found that that's had an impact in terms of giving you milestones that you look back and, and obviously right now you're about to create a brand new milestone with a rebrand. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, which is like hugely, and maybe this is me, me, me certainly reading from the outside in, but it feels like it's going to be such an impactful change Yeah. in, in part because of, of the, the name and the, the reason you've chosen to go with the name. Yeah. It's so many things. The, the reason I've named my company, what I've named it is very personal and what it might like uh, for me, this is my legacy brand. This is mm -hmm. like, I want my kids to, I want my kids to take over my business. And so, um, okay. The, the brief story of the agency name is, so it's called the cast agency cast with the K. So my husband is a lifelong video gamer. He learned to read like playing legend of Zelda, like as a kid. And, and Mario and all that kind of stuff. And so when you were in gaming in the eighties and nineties, when you had to like create your name, you had four letters that you could use. And so he came up with this moniker of kale. And so then when he got bigger or when, or when games got better and he got older, they, they increased it to like eight. And so he created this kale cast character. Well, he also has brothers and his brothers, you know, all little kids want to be just like their big brother. And so they created names that were four letters with cast at the end. And it became this like ongoing joke. So anyone that came in to my husband's world got a cast moniker. And so like mine is Rose cast. My kids have one. My daughter's pixie cast. My son is flick cast. Like it's just a thing. And so cast is like our family, like moniker, our family, like, a gamer name and so it was a fun way to like tie that connection in plus there's all a plethora of like video game silliness that you can have <laughs> around it and that you can do and stuff and so because it's like that legacy thing i want my kids to take it over it's it's like setting that that part of it up for success and then the way it's structured is very much focused on has long-term growth because no matter what happens with online marketing and there someone still needs to head it up uh, someone still needs to help brands with like what they want to do with their marketing. And a lot of companies still can't afford always to hire marketing managers. So having someone that they can turn to for help ideation, all that stuff is always going to be necessary. And so that's like what I'm, I'm doing with the agency piece. That's why it's so important and necessary. And like, but with like kind of your original question though, around like milestones and stuff, it's very interesting to me because social media has changed and moved so fast. And so it's almost like how I measure the state of social media is based on what was going on in my world at the time. Right. So like my space, it was college getting out of college, Facebook, it was Italy and 
everyone coming, I coming together with my college peers and people asking me how to do it. Twitter was because I kept seeing it in commercials on TV. And I was like, what is this Twitter thing? Um, Foursquare was because I wanted to be an expert, wanted to be like the go-to person for something. And like, it was new and fun. And I was like, let's do it. Let's dive into it. And I did, I got well, well established in my Foursquare community before I pivoted into something else. You know, I think about like, um, like Google plus, like Google plus to me, like I have Google glass glasses. Yeah. Um, I was able to like be on a part of like that world. Um, I actually had a girl who came to my wedding and her job was to just wear Google glass and record everything that's happening at my wedding because oh, that's wow. why they gave it to me. They told me like, I told them I'm talking at my wedding. They're like, yeah, done. Google plus bride. Right. Like that was the whole thing. Um, I actually have a picture of me in my wedding dress on my wedding day wearing Google glass. It's actually pretty good. Um, you know, so it's like those kinds of things, being able to measure like where we were in social media based on like what was going on in my life, because it was just going so fast. Like Facebook played such an important role in my life when my kids were little, because it was the diary it was how I was able to share my kids with my family and my friends, because we didn't live near them because we were in the military and we went to be another country, you know? So that was like a really big, important part of what we were doing. You know, YouTube was how I how I branched my, I, I globalized my brand um, and became this big, like foundational piece of my business. You know, co with start of COVID, it was like the live streaming era and like stream yard and how do we make online marketing work for any business, not, you know, and, and be effective in those spaces, you know, and TikTok, TikTok like blew up from all of that as well. And, and so it's just like, how, how did that change it? Cause we had YouTube that was so important. And then this new TikTok thing that everyone was like kind of enter entertaining. And then by 2022, TikTok was a required platform for like all businesses. So it's like these ebbs and flows of like where things are and, and what they do. And like that. So that's how I measure like the milestones of socials, like what was going on in my life around that time. And like, that's where social media was. And is there, is there like a, when you think of the revenue that, that goes alongside those, did it, did it mirror the evolution of, of moving from one platform to another, or did it have its, its, its own, its own kind of revenue trajectory? So all of my revenue was always supported by social. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing that's complicated about revenue in the creator space is it changes just as much as the creator economy changes right so let's give an example i got really into the amazon influencer program in 2022 At the end of 2021 my agency was again it was in this weird awkward place where i didn't know what i wanted to do with it um and i wanted i needed to have something that could give me some financial help while i figured mm -hmm. that out and i did i i, I ended up like pivoting the agencies like i went through waves of like package changes and i i had created a way for me to like do video content that's what i needed to figure out. i needed to figure out how could i do video content for my clients um and so i had to figure out that and systemize it so i needed money though while i did it. so i was like my buddy alan who was in the uk he was like you should do this like you have a house you can buy stuff on amazon all the time you should just do these videos so i was like all right i'll figure all this works so i did it there was a little, I had made some money a little bit like the year before. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go hard on this. Like, oh my God, what did I do? I feel like I did like 10 videos a day, like 90 days. Like I did it. Wow. I think if you look back at like where my, I have like over 400 videos on my Amazon wow. influencer page. Wow. Um, I went hard on it and I, and it paid off super fast. In the first month in January, I made 600 bucks. The next month I made 2000 bucks. The third month I made 3,400 bucks. And then for the rest of the year, I averaged between four to $5,000. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I was, it's literally, literally it was someone's salary. Like that's the kind of money I was making. Like it was someone's salary was as much as I was making from doing videos about stuff I just bought off of Amazon. Regular stuff like here, let me tell you about this brush. Here, let me tell you about this like concealer. Let me tell you about this cup. And nothing to do with my brand. My brand just qualified me for it. I didn't, you know, all of my filming equipment. I never did a single video about my filming equipment. It was always just like house stuff. Um, but then they changed the program. Like a year later, 
2023, they made two really big changes. One, they just said that, so how the associates program used to work is anything that was in the cart, everything that someone bought. So like if I bought all three of these things, but I only one of them came from you, I got commissions off of everything in the cart. And I lost, I started losing like a third. I think I, I had a median drop from like 4,500 down to like $3,000. It was a very big drop. And it made me really mad too, because it's like, not just because it's like the idea of like, why don't I get everything in the cart? It's like, sometimes I would send someone to buy a, a, a makeup brush and then they would go buy makeup and they wouldn't be able to buy that makeup if they didn't buy the makeup brush. So like, it was like their purchase that made sense. So that always bothered me. And then the next thing that they did is they moved where influencer videos were. So influencer videos used to be above reviews for products and they moved them underneath the reviews. And I was like, I, I this was a good run. We had a good time, Amazon. Thanks. I'm out. And I still make money off it. I think I make somewhere between three to 500 bucks a month, depending on how much everyone's shopping. But it was just, it just became this thing that was like not worth my time because I had no control over it. And if all, and like, I, and I'm a, the queen of telling you, like you cannot put all of your eggs in one basket financially. So you have to diversify. So even while I'm doing all this Amazon stuff, I'm still doing other things to diversify my income where literally my Amazon money just became bonus money. And so um, it was, it was just doing that piece of it. So when we're talking about creator revenue, it, it changes a lot because people want to put their gas on stuff and like, well, I don't want to give you that much money a lot. And it's a lot of that back and forth. And so it's figuring out how to manage all that, that I think is the job of the creator. And, and so what do your revenue streams look like now in terms of the, obviously the diversified, but, but how, how diverse yeah, what do you look I, like? I, I, I think I have somewhere in the realm of like nine, 10 revenue streams. I have the agency, I have affiliates, I have sponsorships, I have UGC, I have Amazon, I have syndication, um, coaching. I have a book. Uh, it's like, it's like a lot of like those little things to diversify. I have AdSense. I still get AdSense from YouTube, which isn't great. It was better. COVID era, <laughs> um, but there are all these little dollar amounts that add up that, that allow for me to continue to support my family and the things I want to do. And how, how did you onboard the different revenue streams? Like, was, were, was it led by you? Were you influenced by other people? Uh, it's a lot of, so the thing about YouTube. So when I, um, when I decided to like utilize YouTube more as like a big part of my income, um, it was in 2018. So was it 2018? End of 2018 into early 2019. So I was really into it. I was doing good. I was cruising along. I had very slow growth. Um, it took me eight, 18 months to get to a thousand subscribers. And, um, I was just, I was into it. And I was like, I like this. I think it still work really well. I want to keep doing this and I wanted to learn more. And when I went to go learn more about YouTube on YouTube, everyone that I could learn from was a man. And I'm not, and, and nothing against men. Men are the best, but men don't know what it's like to be a mom. Men don't know what it's like. Like there are just some things that men as a, from a creator perspective, foundation, just can't understand. And also YouTube is notoriously anti-woman, which to the point where this year at VidCon, YouTube announced like we're working actively to make YouTube more female friendly. And they have a whole marketing initiative and platform initiative. And I talked to them about like all of that stuff. Like I've learned as I've championed women a video for five years, right? So I couldn't learn from women back in 2018. And then I got really upset because I go to this, I was going to this conference um, for a few years called Social Media Marketing World. And they they had gone all, gone all in on YouTube, like they were committed to its success. And um, every educator that they brought was also a man. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. and so I had pitched like, hey, what if you guys did a panel, like a panel of this conference? It's like how marketer marketing companies can work with creator women to like do this. Like we like this idea. We already have our entire like 
itinerary planned, you should do this as a live stream. And so I reached out to a company called TubeBuddy um, in like, I would say February of 2019 to do it as a live stream. And they jumped on me within 10 minutes of me emailing them. They were like, yes, we'll do this. And so it worked out on them. So we did a live stream with a couple of my fellow creator friends. It went very well. Um, a lot of people kept asking for more. And so I was like, all right, sure. And so I was like, I don't have it in me to do another YouTube channel. It's a lot of work, but I could do a podcast. The podcast is much easier and much more manageable. And so in October, 2019, I launched women of YouTube, which has been rebranded to women of video in 2022. We're at 230 something episodes and about to celebrate five years. But it was in that time, those beginning years where I was like trying to learn about YouTube and like what it could be, I started hearing about these things I had never heard about before, like affiliate marketing, sponsors, AdSense. Like to me, YouTube was just always a lead source to my agency. It never was anything else. And so it was like, what do you mean I can make money on YouTube? Like, huh? Like, and keep in mind, this is 2018. And while YouTube had been around for 12 years at this point, and there are plenty of people that were full-time YouTubers, it wasn't, it still wasn't a thing. Like being a Facebooker or a Facebook creator, an Instagrammer, like all that stuff, that was more common hat than YouTube, which is so weird to think about, like how it's changed again so much in the last six years. Um, and I was like, what is all of this? So I started learning and I started making friends with people that did good. So like when I did this thing with TubeBuddy, um, they invited me to their offices, which is this really small little space. It was like one big room that a bunch of them were in. And I was in the room with like Roberto Blake and Nick Nimmin and Daniel Batal and, um, Justin Brown. And like, we were just all in this like beginner growth phase they were way better than i was at that time too like they were way ahead of me i should say um and i was just learning from them and taking it and figuring it out and i was like oh my god oh my my god like you can do these things and i started learning about monetization from platforms and all of this stuff but i didn't know just like you don't know anything when you start doing something (laughs) so um it really unfolded through like experiences opportunities just coming to me like i said my friend alan uh, he was, he and I started, when I started my YouTube channel, he was like my YouTube manager. Like he helped me and we've been friends for years ever since. And, um, he's the one that told me about Amazon. I had a company come to me. That's like, Hey, we want to take your content and repurpose it to our platform. And we'll do a rev share 50, 50. And I was like, cool. That's been like a few thousand dollars. I get every couple months, like with us two buddy. And now vidIQ sponsors my podcast and they pay me every month. So it's like, these is opportunities that like right place, right time, right situations, right networking just led me to like where I am now to the point where now it's mm. my job to teach people how to make money yeah. through the creator economy, <laughs> including not people and brands, right? So that they can figure out how to be successful together. So along that journey, then I'm, I'm sure there's probably been some, some real good advice. Do you recall the best advice that you've received? I think the best overall message I have received about YouTube from multiple friends and peers is really like you're only limited by like your imagination when it comes to the creator economy. There are so many ways for you to make money. There are so many ways for you to get control of your time to systemize, to do things. And it's like, It's my responsibility to figure out what makes sense for me, what works for me short-term and long-term and what can I sustainably do and then build my life and then build that business around what I want for my life. And so what I want for my life is to be able to have the flexibility to do what I want or need to. Cause again, I have kids who are almost nine and 10 and I have a husband and I have a house and I have an insatiable love of travel. So I want to be able to have that flexibility and I'm building a bit, I've built a business and I continue to build a business that gives me that flexibility. So what about that flip side? What's the, what's the worst advice that you've, uh, that you've received? Um, 
just start creating and the rest of it will fall into line. <laughs> I think that's the dumbest advice I've ever heard. And I've heard it a lot from really big creators. Just start creating. The money will come. I'm like, fuck no. Sorry, I'm not allowed to swear, but I'm like, no, that's terrible advice. I'm like, build a business, like create intentionally, like build add a make an email or something. Like there's just that's the worst and is, that, is that like about YouTube. just start creating is, and the money will come is, is that the, is that the <laughs> is that the most common mistake that you see creators making then would you say yeah probably which is probably why that that advice that you get on the grand scale is so, and, and i don't think it's that's a bad way to start i just think that now like that's how you started before covid like that's the pre-COVID world of doing things. We live in a post-COVID world. Like we are four and a half years since COVID happened. Like you can't do business that way anymore. When I was at VidCon, they did a panel. It's like like YouTube business and they had all these creators on stage. All of them had been creators for like eight to 12 years. And I was like, guys, like you can't give advice to a room full of people based on how you did it. Like, you know, like how you started doesn't, the way you started, ah, the way you started doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so that's, that's, I think what a lot of people do now and doesn't work. And that's why it's so frustrating for so many. Content then do you think is actually overrated? No, just not, not creators. Let's not go there. But what kind of content do you think is, uh, is overrated? I don't think that there's any kind of content that's overrated. I think that, I mean, I think Mr. I think creators are, I think Mr. Beast is overrated. I think that the bit, not even just, not even just Jimmy, I think all big creators are overrated, but that's because they're exceptions, mm. not rules. And everybody makes them mm. the standard. And that I think is super unhealthy and unrealistic for our industry. So what about a uh, a creator you really admire at the moment? Oh man, that's hard. Um, I have to go look at my YouTube channel. <laughs> I really like Colin and Samir. I think that they're good. They're like mm. the VH1 of the creator economy. Um, I love Jessica Stansberry. She's one of my really good friends. I've known her for years. Um, I really like Vanessa Lau. I really love Meredith Marsh. I really love... The Super Carlin brothers. Um, I really love Latasha James. I, um, I really love Sarah Ray Vargas. Yeah, I'm scrolling my YouTube. This is a lot of people I watch. And right that's, that's that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and, and we are spoiled for choice, right? Like there's there's so yes. much good content and so many good content creators that it's. Uh, there are unfortunately are people you have to choose not to watch just by virtue of not having the time. There's always room for more. And there's also plenty to watch and enjoy and learn from as well. So a few, a few kind of uh, questions to, to round this out and, um, and, and I will go into a quick fire round, but AI, obviously it's on everyone's lips at the moment. Um, how much are you leveraging AI at the moment and and where do you see it going? So I am not in love with AI for art. Um, I think it's because I am an artist by trade and, and at heart, but I also hate the lack of control you have over it. I like it for ideation and stuff, but like I don't love it for other things. Um, I love AI though from like a helping me standpoint but it never could replace me because it doesn't it's still, no matter how much I train it on how to do like my voice or do so, it just isn't always quite right, but it's helped me with a lot of things like writing emails, putting together proposals, brainstorming stuff, titles, um, descriptions for stuff. Like I, 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 I haven't been able to dive into using it for personal use in the same way, but I know that there's a lot of potential there. Um, more than for business and creator space. I know a lot of people have like the faceless videos and the AI stuff. I, I don't, I think it's all flash in the pan. I don't think that there's any longevity to it because people connect with people and AI doesn't know how to be people. Not that there's not outlier create like AI creators and robot creators, things like that. But for the most part, I think that people, there's a place, there, there'll always be a place for people. 
and it's a tool not a replacement and it's a great it's a great observation that okay so quick fire round here we go first one instagram or tiktok tiktok youtube or tiktok youtube instagram or youtube YouTube. Okay. High value or high volume? High value. Niche market or broad appeal? Niche market. Build your email list or create more content? Build your email list. Single platform focus or a multi-platform approach? Single platform focus. Creator or influencer? Creator. <laughs> and I think I know the answer to this that last one. Trends or strategy? because <laughs> <Strategy. laughs> trends can be part of your strategy and creators can be influencers but influencers can't always be good creators <laughs> so one last piece of advice then if you were starting from zero today what would you do first i think if i saw some of you're starting from zero today it would be take the time to figure out what you want to sell and who you want to sell it to because those two factors will dictate where you create and what you create going forward. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, you have been an absolutely amazing guest. Um, Thanks, Liz. Uh, I guess the, the only other question I've got for you is, is where's the best place to connect and, and find you online? LinkedIn. You can find me at LinkedIn and my name, Desiree Martinez, and everything kind of funnels from there. <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Thank you again so much. You've been very generous with your wisdom, your uh, pearls of learning that you shared today. Um, thanks for sharing your road to revenue. Thank you.